Mr. President, I wanted to come to the floor and talk for a few minutes about the unfortunate circumstances we find ourselves in as a result of the failure of the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee to submit a letter that she got from, in this case, we now know Dr. Ford, to the background investigators uh, who are bipartisan, who would have investigated this matter during the normal course of the confirmation process in a way that protected the anonymity and the confidentiality of Dr. Ford, as well as the nominee. As a presiding officer knows, having been a longtime member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, frequently during the course of a background investigation, we will learn things that uh, senators will want to ask the nominee about. But some of them are so sensitive and frankly, some of them involve allegations we just don't know whether there's any basis to them or not. And so they are handled in a particularly careful manner by the background investigators and are not generally made available to members of the Judiciary Committee staff because they are so sensitive and potentially embarrassing. And frankly, we just have to get to the bottom of them. Uh, but we want to do so in a way that's respectful of both the person making an accusation as well as the nominee. Unfortunately, none of that happened here because we now know that uh, the ranking member, uh, our friend Senator Feinstein, sat on this letter for some six weeks. And then after the hearing, after all the thousand plus questions for the record, after being able to uh, examine not only the, the nominee for two days for over a long period of time, having gone through a FBI background investigation and as well as a bipartisan background investigation of uh, the Judiciary Committee staff, uh, this letter comes out in a way that, frankly, puts Dr. Ford in an uncomfortable position, but also has consequences in terms of the nominee. And many of us saw last night uh, Judge Kavanaugh talk about the impact of this accusation that he denies ever occurring, its impact on his children, on his marriage, and on his reputation. This is not something any of us should welcome or take lightly, especially when there's an alternative which would have protected Dr. Ford and the nominee and allowed us to get to the bottom of this accusation before it would ever have the potential of becoming public. I just don't buy this idea either that if you're a man, you're on one side of this argument when it comes to accusations of sexual misconduct, or if you're a woman, you're on the other side. All of us have mothers. We all have fathers. Many of us have brothers and sisters. Many of us are fortunate enough to have daughters, as I do. I want to make sure my daughters and my wife and my sister are treated with the dignity and respect that they're entitled to, were they to be so unfortunate as to be caught up in a situation where they were a victim of sexual misconduct by a man. Conversely, this idea that just because you're a man, you're presumed to be guilty because somebody makes an accusation without presenting, that, presenting any evidence of that to support that accusation strikes me as being uniquely antithetical to our constitutional system and our sense of what is fair play. I'll talk about that more in just a second. I'm very proud to support the nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, for the United States Supreme Court. I've had the fortune uh, to know him since about 2000. He is an exceptional nominee by all res in all respects. And I, along with the majority leader and others, think it is a disservice to him, as well as our courts, as well as the Senate and the confirmation process for us to sit idly by and allow our colleagues across the aisle to blow up the normal process and to denigrate a reputation he has spent a career to build, especially without solid evidence. Again, we all feel sympathy, we should, for people who claim sexual assault, and we owe them an opportunity for a fair chance to tell their story and to produce evidence. 
and we have recourse in our courts of law and elsewhere when those sort of serious accusations are made. But we also need to consider both sides of the equation. We need to consider the impact on the nominee, somebody who served more than 12 years as a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and before that worked for the President of the United States in the White House Counsel's Office. His public service has required him to undergo not one FBI background check, but six FBI background checks. And he passed all of them with flying colors. Never before in any of those six background checks has this accusation been lodged. Not once in his long career has there been any allegation of improper conduct on the part of Judge Kavanaugh toward women. Not once, other than this allegation. As I said, Mr. President, I think as we think about what a fair process is, and Judge Kavanaugh talked about that last night, we need a fair process. We need not to assume somebody is guilty because an allegation has been made, frankly, in the criminal law context, we wouldn't want to give the government that much power to be able to deny us of our liberty, our property, even our life, by just an accusation without requiring credible evidence to be presented in order to prove it before an impartial jury or judge. This is a constitutional principle, a bedrock constitutional principle of our form of government. It is very disturbing and it's dangerous to hear some of our colleagues try to turn that principle on its head and say it's up to Judge Kavanaugh to disprove the allegations. He said it never happened. How could he possibly disprove the allegation when he said it never happened? Well, that just shows the uh, extent to which I think we've gotten off track in this confirmation process. We've already heard an awful lot about the judge, and by all accounts, he is well qualified. According to friends, mentors, law clerks, attorneys, and professors, everybody who testified about his nomination considered him to be a man of integrity, and I believe that personally to be the fact. So it ought to trouble all of us that notwithstanding this orderly, respectful process by which the Judiciary Committee conducts background investigations, including accusations like the one being made by Dr. Ford, when that emerges at the 11th hour, and it makes no sense in terms of what we know about the nominee, it doesn't fit the picture. When something is alleged that's so completely out of character for what we do know about the nominee, it strains, it ought to strain our credulity. And I, unlike some of our colleagues across the, across the aisle, do not believe we should rush to judgment and simply assume the worst. Of course, the other attribute of a fair process, Mr. President, would be an impartial judge or somebody who hadn't already made up their mind. We know that's not the case among our Democratic colleagues. The minority leader said he would do everything in his power to stop the nominee long before this accusation came up. And I believe none of the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee would have supported the nominee even before they knew about this allegation. That's not a fair process. They are not a neutral observer or an impartial arbiter of the facts. So they're more than happy to embrace thinly sourced allegations, even character assassinations based on shreds of evidence, if you can dignify it by calling it that. But that's not an approach that I think we should support. It's certainly not an approach I can support. And I don't think it's a process anybody in the Senate or any Americans should support. It's short-sighted, it's narrowly focused, and wrong.
I once told a friend, when the facts no longer make, difference, make a difference in an argument, I'm going to look for a new line of work. But the facts do matter, and these are the facts. Right now, we have one primary allegation regarding Judge Kavanaugh and then another one that just popped up in the last day or so that I'll talk about in a moment. Americans are all too familiar now with the misconduct that one person claims occurred more than 35 years ago. It's really hard to reconstruct things that happened Thirty-five years ago. I think we all know that from our common experience. I wonder if anybody within the sound of my voice could tell me what were you doing 35 years ago on a given day, in a given month, at a given time? Could you reconstruct in your own memory what you were doing at that time and that on that date, where you were, who you were with? Well, we also have to bear in mind that Judge Kavanaugh has said that this alleged incident simply did not happen. And he said so under penalty of a felony. In other words, if you lie to the FBI, if you lie to Congress during the course of a background investigation or in testimony to Congress, that is subject to a criminal penalty. Now, because Dr. Ford didn't go through the normal background investigation, she has not had to give evidence to the committee or to the Congress under that same penalty for perjury. Judge Kavanaugh has, but she hasn't. But she will have that chance this Thursday. I firmly believe that a fair process means that both the accuser and the accused should be required to provide information to the Congress, to the Senate, to the Judiciary Committee under the same conditions. In other words, if one witness testifies under oath, then both witnesses should testify under oath. If, both witness, if one witness is subject to a penalty of perjury for lying, then both witnesses should be subject to a penalty in the event of perjury for lying. That's what, that's another attribute of a fair process that Judge Kavanaugh ta talked about last night. We can't ignore the fact that so far no one else has corroborated Dr. Ford's statements. And she herself concedes she told no one about this alleged incident, not even a friend, a family member, in 2012. And only then without mentioning Brett Kavanaugh's name. The Judiciary Committee investigators, as you would want and expect, have already been in touch with the four other people whom Dr. Ford claimed were involved in this incident. And all four have denied having any knowledge of this event. That's a fact. Can't ignore it, shouldn't ignore it. That's something we ought to consider as part of a fair process. Nevertheless, we have really done everything we possibly can, acceded to every reasonable demand being made by Dr. Ford and her lawyers to give her an opportunity to be heard. We welcome, we welcome her testimony. And we will listen to her at the hearing that's been scheduled for this Thursday. We welcome her participation, but we insist on a fair process, a fair process to her and a fair process to the nominee, one that allows her and Judge Kavanaugh to testify, to explain, to justify, to corroborate if they can. Again, one of the hallmarks of a fair process is the presumption of innocence. This presumption of guilt based on an unproven accusation, is un-American. It's absolutely foreign to who we are as a country. And the sort of process demanded under our Constitution for people accused of serious misconduct. So far, this process has been patently unfair, both to Dr. Ford and to Judge Kavanaugh, 
because the ranking member sat on this letter for six weeks, didn't submit it to the regular background investigation process that would have protected Dr. Ford and her confidentiality while it was being pursued. Now, as a result of the way this was handled by the ranking member, her letter, which she requested remain confidential, and her complaint, which she requested remain anonymous, was leaked to the press, a media firestorm ensued, and I'm confident this is not what Dr. Ford wanted when she sent that letter to the, our ranking member on the Judiciary Committee. It's important that Dr. Ford be given the chance to talk about what she believes happened to her. We are in the middle of an important national conversation about sexual assault and how certain people in positions of power wield their influence to coerce and intimidate women in the workplace and at large. This is a long overdue conversation, but we can't let the pendulum swing so far as to deny the accused his or her basic rights. The Judiciary Committee, as I said, is no stranger to these sorts of allegations. As one of our own members stepped down this Congress after acknowledging his own misconduct. But if, as Judge Kavanaugh says, the conduct in question never occurred, he shouldn't be used as some sort of sacrificial lamb on behalf of larger causes and concerns to which he is in no way attached or implicated. That would be unjust. That would be the opposite of fair. And it was established a terrible precedent for nominees moving forward. We can't, and we shouldn't let that happen. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, Grass, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman Grassley, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I believe has done an extraordinary job under very difficult circumstances. He's been extraordinarily gracious in trying to accommodate Dr. Ford. That's what we all have wanted, even after a legal team ignored offers and deadlines over the course of last week. I have to be honest, though. Some of the tactics waged so far make me wonder whether Dr. Ford is still in control of her own story and her own circumstances. It makes me wonder whether she is being exploited by a political cause and whether her handlers and some of her supporters truly have her interests at heart. I wonder that particularly given that after insisting this sensitive matter be treated confidentially, why it was that the letter in the possession of our colleagues on the Judiciary Committee on the Democratic side was leaked to the media and Dr. Ford forced to go forward publicly. Remember, the reason why our friend, the ranking member from California, said she withheld this allegation until the very last minute was to protect Dr. Ford and to respect her request for anonymity. But that was then trampled on, ignored, and her wishes betrayed when this letter was leaked to the press. Again, this is a particularly troubling matter, but one of our colleagues on the Judiciary Committee on the other side of the aisle has gone so far as to suggest that Judge Kavanaugh doesn't deserve the presumption of innocence. That just because a 36-year, 35-year-old allegation was made, we must presume he's guilty. Well, she said she believes that because, not because of anything to do with his reputation for honesty or truthfulness or anything about the facts. She said it's because of the way he conducts his judging, the way he approaches cases. That is an extraordinarily disturbing statement. I think it should be to all of us 
This idea that he has denied a, what is a constitutional right when an accusation is made of a crime because of the way he performs his job as a judge deciding cases, that ought to disturb all of us. I hope our colleagues will approach Thursday's hearing with much more of an open mind than apparently she will. As I mentioned a moment ago, it is true that now there is a second allegation reported against Judge Kavanaugh, and it stems from a New Yorker article that was published a couple of, a couple of days ago. But obviously, it does not hold up to scrutiny. You don't have to take my word for it. Just ask the New York Times. The New York Times looked into it, conducted dozens of interviews, trying to find anybody who would corroborate this allegation, and they wouldn't touch it because they couldn't get anybody else to say, yeah, that's what happened. One journalist said on the air that Democrats sought this second woman out and essentially convinced her to make an accusation against Judge Kavanaugh. According to the story, no one the accuser knows has corroborated her claim. That's why the New York Times wouldn't report it. They interviewed several dozen people, and they looked really hard. You can imagine how hard those reporters looked to find somebody, anybody, who would corroborate this allegation. But they couldn't find anybody. What they did find is that the accuser herself reportedly told others she wasn't sure if the perpetrator was actually Judge Kavanaugh. She told others that she was talking to about possibly corroborating her accusation. She wasn't sure it was Judge Kavanaugh. Yet now this information has been distributed in the press and around the country in a way that really is extraordinarily shameful. I don't say this often, but good for the New York Times. Thanks for upholding a modicum of journalistic integrity by not reporting this uncorroborated allegation where the person who is making the accusation said, I may have the wrong guy. And shame on the New Yorker and others who've published this, this junk journalism. Well, Mr. President, Judge Kavanaugh is not going away, as he said. Despite the allegations made against him, which he says are false and did not happen, despite the smear campaign on his reputation as a person of integrity, despite the threats made against him and his family, he said he will not be intimidated into withdrawing and vowed to defend both of his integrity and his good name before the Judiciary Committee this week. As the delay tactics continue to play out and the news stories continue to pile up, let's not lose sight of why Judge Kavanaugh was nominated in the first place. His qualifications and the respect that he enjoys from all of those who've interacted with him professionally and personally. His work has been praised by legal practitioners and scholars alike. He's been unanimously affirmed by the Supreme Court on numerous occasions. And during his grueling week-long confirmation hearing, he showed the kind of poise and the seriousness befitting of the high office to which he has been nominated. He fielded many, many questions from Republicans and Democrats, and he responded to all of them truthfully, articulately and graciously. So while it's easy to be distracted by the latest irresponsible, unsubstantiated allegation, we need to put that in a larger context. Surely these allegations cannot be viewed in isolation. Nor can the fact that uh, our colleagues across the aisle have previously questioned Amy Coney Barrett 
for her Catholic faith. Judge Kavanaugh's a practicing Catholic as well. Amy Coney Barrett, who was nominated for, who had been nominated for the Seventh Circuit, was asked, or actually she was told, in questioning her Catholic faith, she was told that the dogma lived loudly within her, suggesting somehow that because she is a practicing Catholic, she could not be confirmed to the Circuit Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. We don't have religious tests in this country, and no matter what your faith or background or the absence of faith in a higher being, we should not be attacking nominees for their religion or their faith or their lack of faith. We should be confirming good nominees who can apply the law and the Constitution as written. But it is important, I think, to put the Amy Coney Barrett questioning and statement in this context, given the background and faith of this nominee. Mr. President, we will try our best to get to the truth this week. We will listen carefully, but we will remember all of the evidence. And then we will vote on whether to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. Our Democratic colleagues have dragged this out long enough. There will be no more delays, and soon it will be the time to vote. So I say to my friends, we will hear from Dr. Ford. We've done our best to accommodate her, to give her a safe place where she can tell her story under oath to members of the Judiciary Committee that will be voting on this nomination. Likewise, Judge Kavanaugh will be placed under oath and be able to give his testimony, both of them subject to the penalties for perjury, which is routine requirement for everybody giving testimony. But we have to remember this has to be a fair process both to the accused and the accuser. And some of the rhetoric, some of the statements that I've heard about the process have been anything other than fair. To either one of them, thanks to the fact that this letter was not disclosed earlier, but then dropped into the public view, notwithstanding the reluctance of Dr. Ford to have her identity revealed. So we are where we are, Mr. President. We have a job to do. Under the Constitution, it is the Senate's re responsibility to provide advice and consent on nominations to the United States Supreme Court. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that after hearing from Dr. Ford and after hearing from Judge Kavanaugh. Just as we have heard for days from Judge Kavanaugh and other nominees following an extensive FBI background investigation and investigation by the bipartisan professional staff on the Senate Judiciary Committee. We are going to know everything that can be known about the nominee and about this alleged incident that Judge Kavanaugh said never occurred 35 plus years ago. Again, I can't tell you where I was on any given day of the week 35 years ago at a certain time of day. That's why our job is so difficult. But we're going to do our very best in fairness to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh to try to bring this matter to a fair conclusion. Mr. President, I yield the floor.